This time on Biblio Nomads, we go from the Penguin Book of Japanese Short Stories to this. <laughs> What an adventure! We're Colin Ave, and we love to travel and also read. Exploring bookstores, libraries, and discovering new authors is super fun and gives us a deeper understanding of the places we're visiting. We want to share what we read and encourage you to pick up a book or two on your next adventure. Welcome to Biblio Nomads. So usually one of our first stops is a bookstore. This bookstore in Kyoto is called Maruzen, and it's got this awesome English section. Before we came to Japan, we had read things like Murakami, but we were actually quite unprepared for the huge amount of great literature Japan has to offer. Though it was tempting to buy all of them, we settled on one book that we highly recommend, a short story collection. Penguin Books has put together a collection of some of the best Japanese short stories, and it was an amazing way to get a taste of multiple authors. From this, we were able to find a bunch of other books that we dove into later. So we got the book, and the stories inside range from 1898 to 2014. It covers topics from Japan and the West, samurais, nature, modern life, disasters, Hiroshima. It has a wide sampling of various historical and cultural events that have happened in Japan. But what are we going to focus on today? Well, it's actually the very first story in here. It's called The Story of Tomoda and Matsunaga by Tanazaki Junichiro. Tanazaki is one of the most famous authors in Japan. The story is about a man who's trying to solve a mystery. And in the story, he leaves his city and he goes to a small countryside village. His description of the journey, which we both read independently, struck us as really beautiful, really interesting, and somewhere that we would love to visit. So we were really surprised when we discovered that the area that he walked is actually really close to where we're staying in Kyoto. And not only that, we could do the exact same route that the character in the story took. So that's what we did. We headed out that morning from Kyoto. We went down to the main station, navigated the crowds and the labyrinth and the hostile gatekeeping machines in order to find our train. Ave immediately fell asleep. We had three trains to go on, each of them got progressively smaller and progressively prettier. Uh, thankfully, Ave stayed awake for the last one so that we could get some beautiful footage. Like, look at that, isn't that, isn't that nice? Unfortunately, I was unaware of this, uh, completely. And eventually, we pulled into the station that our narrator begins his walk from. And here's where we are, and here's where we're gonna go. If you can look on the top right, that's us. Like, there's the train and we're at the station at the top of the train tracks. This is very nice. So pretty. But what is this story actually about? The story of Tomoda and Matsunaga begins with our narrator, a writer, receiving a letter from a woman whose husband has gone missing. Her husband, the titular Mr. Matsunaga, is a deeply religious and conservative man, and he's been missing for three years. Her only lead is a postcard she's found in his bag, which is a correspondence between our writer-narrator and the mysterious Mr. Tomoda, who she is trying to track down. Turns out our writer buddy does know Mr. Tomoda, a larger-than-life man with a huge appetite for women, food, and drink. And the two men couldn't be more different. Our narrator is quickly pulled into the investigation, trying to discover the link between Mr. Tomoda and Mr. Matsunaga. I won't give away the ending, but it was very enjoyable. However, enjoyable as the story is, the thing that brought us out here was the description of the countryside that is given when our main character goes out to visit Mr. Matsunaga in his hometown. I'll let it speak for itself here. Under a clear blue sky, I sat out on foot along the road that led the two or three miles to the village of Yagyu. It is difficult to convey a sense of the happiness I felt as I walked through the Yamato countryside that spring day, but anyone who has had a similar experience will understand what I felt. The sense of well-being that was mine as I wound my way slowly along the path. Yamato is a flat country, with almost no real mountains or deep secluded valleys. Bright, almost white roads crisscrossed the terrain, linking scattered villages, crossing streams and skirting sloping hillsides. But those peaceful, unpretentious fields were just made to be looked at on a spring day like this. There was beauty in everything, even the most commonplace things. 
in the walls of the earthen storehouses off in the distance, in the thatched roofs, in the trees that lined the roads, in the paddy fields and bamboo groves. Everything danced before my eyes in the sunlight. My spirit soared. I had on a thick winter coat, and sweat soaked the back of my shirt as I walked. From time to time I stopped to admire the view. Somewhere in the distance a reddish mist floated across the foothills. Birds twittered ceaselessly as they flitted by overhead. I'd wandered into a painting of the idyllic village. The legends of the Peace Blossom Spring must have been inspired by scenery like this, I thought. Sloping fields planted with tea stretched all around. The hillside swelled, rising and falling in gentle feminine curves, the row of tea plants glowing like velvet jewels in the sunlight. How magical it all looked. I quite forgot the purpose that had brought me here. I felt I could walk these hillsides all day without a hint of tiredness. Unlike our narrator, we did get tired. So we kept ourselves energized by talking about what we learned. One of the reasons we read these stories is to try and get some insight into the culture that we're experiencing. The only thing you need to remember about this story is that Mr. Matsunaga represents the traditional Japanese way of doing things, and Mr. Tomoda represents the Western way of doing things. I guess the point of the story is that 100 years ago, it's really difficult to be both Westerner and Eastern. Mm -hmm. You have to, in order to, to be it, you literally have to like change everything about yourself. Obviously, I think it's changed in 100 years. But at the same time, I think it's still a struggle that happens here, which is being Japanese, being Western, and where does it fall if you're trying to be in the middle of both? Mm -hmm. Remember when CJ, he like introduced himself and he's like, you can call me CJ. Um, I have a Japanese name. He also told us his name, but he's like, don't call me CJ-san. Or like, he's like, if you call me Mr. CJ, I'll put my like American hat on. And then if you call me this, then I'll just start talking to you in Japanese. And I thought that was really interesting. It reminded me of the story. Some parts I don't think aged well, but I think it's still like, you know, just know that going into the story. The best thing about reading this whole book is the rest of the stories that are in it. This whole discussion that we've been having was from one story that we read. Mm. And there's like 30 stories in this book and each one of them sparked a huge discussion. Because the stories range from like this guy trying to solve this mystery all the way to Hiroshima mm -hmm. and everything in between, daily life. What it feels like to be like a woman. Yeah, there's yeah. just so much to explore and discuss. I love that this tiny adventure came of it but I also love that all the other things that we learned and explored and discussed because of this book. Mm -hmm. So that's a big reason why I'd recommend picking it up, especially yeah. while you're here, because you're constantly coming up against things that you read about in the book. The actual town of Yagyu turned out to be a little anticlimactic. It was literally a one street town and every single thing was closed. However, once there, we discovered a little something extra. <laughs> Not only is this rock the inspiration for the oh. anime Demon Slayer, this town is home to one of the most famous swordsman families in all of Japan, one of which was the one who broke this open when he was fighting with a demon. Speaking of Japan and the West, I think one of the most fun things that we have from Japanese culture is uh, the anime and the Studio Ghibli and all that kind of fun stuff that we grew up with uh, as, as kids, a Nintendo. My life is better because of Pokemon. <laughs> as we walked back home, we stopped off at a shrine to do a little wrap up of everything we'd learned. And then right after that, we realized that we'd made a pretty big mistake. I think one of the fun things about reading something that is written by authors of the country or even like the city that you're in is for me, I, I feel more present to where I am. Um, say like I just like picked up a book that, uh, you know, that takes place somewhere else. Like I feel like I'm reading for escapism, which is completely fine, but it's sometimes nice to read something that's set it where you are. Cause like every time you just take a walk or you step out your door, or you become more aware of, of things just because you spent some time reading about them. It might be a bit more fun or useful to go outside and actually like experience the world instead of just like sitting at home reading. But there's a lot of downtimes during your trip where you're just sitting and waiting, like on a train, on a bus, on a flight, and taking quiet moments during your travel to like 
sit at a park and read a book. Might as well make it a book that is written by a local author. Yeah, it becomes a lot more enjoyable. And who knows, it might lead you to a cool ancient samurai city. Yeah, might become like a new favorite book. Yeah, I recommend it. It's sometimes hard to get a more deeper understanding of a place when you are traveling, when you only have like two weeks of a vacation and you're trying to hit all the spots and you have this like jam-packed itinerary and you try hard to meet locals but sometimes sometimes it's difficult like I'm just like a naturally shy person and you're solo traveling and it's hard to meet locals um picking up a book of short stories is sometimes a good way to um fill in some of those gaps and now we have to walk home and there <laughs> was our mistake my Chicago's disappointment we didn't realize there was a last bus and train back home and we're not quite sure what to do. How long is it going to take to walk home? Five hours. Five hours. Not even home. To the next town where we can hopefully catch a bus. If we get there by 10 p.m. we can catch a last train home. Uh, but it is 5 30 right now so we'd have to run. No it's six o'clock so we'd have to run for 45 minutes or so in order to get there in time. Yeah. Hold on a second. Oh, that didn't work. <laughs> so currently we're sticking our thumbs out hoping we can hitchhike. People were not that eager to pick us up. Luckily we saw a rainbow and I made a wish and we found a car. We found a friend who's taking us to Nara. Yeah. We're very grateful. Very pretty out there. I definitely thought that we were gonna have to walk the entire way. But we only had three hours and 45 minutes left, so I think we would have made it. We made it. We did. We made it to the train station. So until next time, keep on reading, keep on traveling, and check the bus schedules. <laughs> what an adventure. <laughs>